So, uh, good morning. Uh, I think uh, that today we have how many? Five? Oh, like uh, so last day we had only three. Uh, so, of course, uh, you know now uh, last day uh, we did some introduction and then uh, level of service and uh, do you hear me perfectly? Please somebody answer. Do you hear me perfectly? Yes, sir. Yeah. Please somebody answer. You don't hear me. Yes, sir. We can hear. Yeah, you can hear um, because I am not using any uh, earphones or something. That is why I am asking whether you hear me perfectly or uh, need to use uh, earphones. Yeah. Is the sound quality good or not? Good, sir. Good, no? All ah, right. So that means that I don't want to uh, use earphones, right? All right. Uh, so uh, now last day, uh, we studied uh, some introduction to uh, highway engineering and uh, we did the level of service and uh, we did, uh, you know, uh, the uh, highway components like uh, the cross section elements like lane, shoulder uh, and then uh, you know center median and the things right so uh, today uh, we are going to uh, study uh, some deep theory parts like uh, the horizontal alignment vertical alignment and then side distances and uh, you know uh, super elevation and things right so that is the uh, subject area that we are going to cover today right uh, so uh, let's start Yeah, uh, today uh, now we are going to uh, study horizontal alignment. Right, uh, so what do you mean by a horizontal alignment? Right, uh, horizontal alignment means it is defined as a series of straights and circular curves connected by transition curves indicating the path of a road in plan. Right, uh, so you know. Uh, Horizontal alignment means now uh, uh, once we are going to design a road, you know a road is a 3D element, right? Road is a 3D element and but you know according to uh, the, the, the contemporary technology, now when I say contemporary technology means uh, now you know it is also a bit early, right? Because now today Today there are methods that we can uh, model 3D like infrarods and things, right? But earlier, say uh, some 20 years back, okay, some 20 years back uh, at the beginning of uh, yeah, uh, at the beginning of uh, hey, so many are coming, right? So what happened to you guys last day? They have only uh, three or something, <laughs> right? Okay, uh, right. Uh, then uh, some twenty years back, hmm, it was like uh, you know, three uh, uh, D modeling of a road could not be done, right? A three D modeling of a road could not be done. Now therefore, we had to uh, the. We had to model it in a way so that it comes like, uh, you know, uh, horizontal alignment and vertical alignment, 
right so now of course using the, uh, the conventional software or the modern software now we can model 3d but anyway the theory theory of highway design still goes with horizontal alignment and vertical alignment so that means there is a 3d rod and you have two projections one into the horizontal plane and the other into the vertical plane right so now when it comes to horizontal alignment and finally what happens finally you have to combine these two horizontal alignment and vertical alignment in a manner that a feasible and uh, you know a proper road to result okay so when it comes to horizontal alignment usually it is uh, straights and circular curves okay so you have straights and you have circular curves maybe you have seen one second huh? right uh, so we have uh, yeah uh, so we have states and circular curves connected by transient curve so wh what do you mean by transient curve a transient curve means you know uh, it's like uh, now when it comes to circular curve you have a particular radius you know you have a particular radius right but when it comes to a uh, transient curve it doesn't have such a radius so the radius changes you just think that you have two curves one curve is say 500 meter radius the other curve is say 1000 meter radius now you want to connect these two with the transient curve so what happens is the transient curve changes its radius from 500 to 1000 okay so that is what you call a transient curve so horizontal alignment is basically series of straights and circular curves and please remember we don't have transient curves in national highways we have we have uh, transient curves only in expressways you know the reason why do we put a, a transient curve we put a transient curve because you know uh, maybe most of you have driving licenses you know when you are uh, entering a curve from a straight what happens is uh, the the driver has to take a transition curve on his own using the steering wheel right so that has to be done within the boundaries of the uh, lane width okay so in lesser speeds like so uh, the speeds uh, smaller than 80 kmph you can usually do it without the help of a transition curve but when it comes to higher speeds like say 100 or 110 or 120 you can't do within the boundaries of the lane width so what you do is we provide a transition curve right so then the, uh, the there are tangents and uh, now that, that is what they are telling the tangents may directly be connected where a transition curve could be omitted okay so if you if you can omit a transition curve then we can connect tangents directly to the curve right so when we are going to design a horizontal alignment now please understand now i, to, I told you the uh, road is a 3d element right but you know since we are unable to design it 3d we have two projections one into the horizontal plane and the other into the vertical plane now what we are doing is we design now we have separated them into horizontal plane and to the vertical plane and now we are discussing how we are going to design the horizontal alignment right so when it comes to uh, the horizontal alignment so what are our major considerations so these are safety profile type of facility design speed geotechnical features topography right of the way cost and construction cost and now we are going to discuss these things in detail right now uh, our now this 
horizontal alignment is in three parts curve design the side distance and finally the super elevation right so now i am going to discuss the curve design first part of my lecture okay for this we have to study a small theory okay this is basic physics okay this is basic physics that you have uh, studied uh, in uh, your a levels okay now just think of an instance where a vehicle is moved is moving on a curved path so what happens now do you remember in your childhood maybe sometimes what you have done is you have tied a string to a ball and then you rotate it over your head do you remember uh, the, the uh, children uh, on our times actually we did that and that was very much fun right so when you are rotating that uh, ball tied to a string have you felt have you felt there is a force coming outward from your hand okay yes there is right so what is that force that force is the centrifugal force so in the same manner when a vehicle is moving on a curved path also in a speed okay in a speed what happens is there is a there is an outward force commonly known as the centrifugal force but remember to have this force the the object should be in motion otherwise if you go and park in a curve there will be no force okay because why what is the centrifugal force mv squared over r right so there should be a v a speed okay so in order to resist this force it is a usual practice to super elevate the roadway cross section why now if it is a flat if it is a flat surface what happens if it is a flat surface there is centrifugal force and there is weight of the vehicle and with the weight of the vehicle there is a force called friction force what is friction force friction force f equals mu r mu is the friction factor okay so the centrifugal force if the if the surface is flat the centrifugal force has to be uh, balanced by the friction force along okay friction force along but when you are going to super elevate it that means you slant it uh, you slant it uh, outwards when there is a curve just think that curve is in the left hand side okay so that means uh, it is uh, the, the curve is in uh, clockwise direction just think right then what we do is we slant our road surface into the LHS side okay we slant it to the LHS side so now what happens now this there is centrifugal force and it is being balanced by not only the friction force but a component of the component of what the weight also these are some very small theories right so you know you can just understand so then for a given radius and a speed a set force is required to maintain the vehicle in the circular path following factors are assumed to contribute to this phenomenon okay so you know here just think this is the plan plan means that you are looking at the vehicle motion from the sky okay you are looking at the motion of the vehicle from the sky now what happens here this is the straight and then there is the circular curve and then again the straight right so when a vehicle is moving this way right when a vehicle is moving this way this way starting from lhs to lhs means from my lhs to going to rhs now what happens is then there is a centrifugal force working this way and you are supporting you're not supporting you are balancing the centrifugal force with what with the uh, friction factor and then a component of the weight because that road surface here is slant right so uh, taking this uh, phenomenon we have developed uh, we have developed uh, 
uh, an equation so this is the equation finally now please remember now i am going to reveal a secret of highway design okay why do i call it a secret because you have uh, you didn't know it yet so it is a secret so this is one secret of highway design so this is the equation that all road curves are designed in this country and in any country of the world as far as the road is designed now don't think that uh, uh, when you go to your village uh, and, uh, now there is a gravel road right uh, and uh, the gravel road is curved and that curve is designed into this equation no okay but if there is if the road is designed a national road or something or an expressway or whatever this is the equation so what is this equation r is the radius of the curve and v is the design speed 127 is just a number and e is the super elevation okay super elevation so we are going to discuss what is super elevation super elevation is the percentage of slanting percentage of slanting and f is mu that is the friction factor now why there comes 127 because r is in meters and v is in kmph kilometers per hour so uh, once you uh, take them into same units so you get 127 so if it is if your design speed is 50 you have to just put here 50 okay you don't want to uh, multiply it by 300 3600 and then divided by 100 okay so 1000 and uh, you have to just put 50 here and that is why you get 127 so finally your r comes in meters okay so now i am going to show you a picture of this super elevation thing right now you know uh, now uh, please don't worry why this car is going on the wrong side you know actually uh, in countries like ours we are going uh, on the wrong side of the road why you know only the britain and her former colonies are uh, uh, using i mean driving at the lhs side of the road all other countries america uh, especially all countries in uh, american continent and uh, all countries yeah i'm not very sure about south africa but uh, all other countries in africa and all countries in europe except britain they travel in uh, lhs side sorry rhs side of the road like this and uh, notably uh, i think the only uh, developed countries uh, that travel in lhs side like uh, that of sri lanka are uh, maybe britain and then australia and then japan okay thankfully japan okay otherwise what happens then we cannot import their used cars right uh, yeah so now this is you can see that uh, vehicle is traveling and now what happens there comes a centrifugal force like this and so they say this is super elevation for the, of course there is nothing called super elevation force it is the friction force right you know this transverse friction force right so sorry uh, they have taken transverse friction force like this and super elevation force is come <coughs> sorry a component of the weight okay so uh, don't worry uh, you are not supposed to derive this equation uh, but if you really interested if you are really interested of course uh, you can try uh, just uh, draw this and take this uh, vehicle as an object and mark the all the uh, all the forces acting there and then try to derive this equation of oh, okay there is no such theory of course that is simple physics you can very easily uh, derive this equation maybe uh, yeah if we have time i'll show you how we do it but please remember you are not supposed to derive it in the exam okay we don't ask that question because that is not necessary it is already derived only thing is you should know how to apply after all uh, you are going to be uh, engineers and uh, not uh, you know uh, physicist or something okay 
then the side friction or the value of the coefficient of lateral friction depends upon a number of factors among which the following are dominant right you know there is something called uh, lateral friction right so that friction you know so with the common sense you can understand what are these factors one is vehicle speed and then uh, type and condition of the roadway surface and type and condition of the tires right so with the uh, uh, with that in mind you know side friction factors can be found but there is no such theory you have to find side friction side friction factors used in the uh, research okay so that uh, people have done research now although it says uh, geometric design standards of roads or development authority 1998 only thing is this is how rda uses these side friction factors that is simple f or mu what is simple f you know here that is simple f that is a friction factor usually in physics you use it as a mu but in highway engineering we use it as f simple f and these are the values for uh, these friction factors okay so you know when it comes to 70 km 70 kmph if it is a bituminous road your friction factor or simple f is 0 0.150 okay so if your design speed is 50 and if it is a bituminous road your friction factor is or the side friction factor is 0 0.170 okay and if it is a gravel road okay if your design speed is 50 your friction factor is 0 0.120 so these you have to find using uh, research okay so even though it says is road development authority as far as i know we haven't done any such research in sri lanka so these are the values that has been extracted from austroads okay australian uh, road design standards so why do we use austroads usually uh, we love to follow british or american standards why do we use Australian standards. The reason being, you know, uh, Britain and America, they are having uh, snow and ice on their road. So the friction factors differ substantially from Sri Lankan values. And thankfully, uh, in uh, Australia, uh, there is no snow or at least uh, very little snow. Uh, you know, Australia is a country uh, now don't think when it comes to a country uh, when you call australia don't think it is like uh, sri lanka australia although you call it it a country it is of course few uh, segregated cities only okay uh, and uh, most of their countries uh, desert is a desert okay so then uh, there are some few segregated uh, cities and these cities you don't have snow as far as i know so that is why we use uh, the side friction factors of uh, australia right so we'll uh, discuss uh, now you know uh, road horizontal alignment uh, you know in a horizontal alignment it is uh, curves and straights now do we have to speak anything about the straights of course no why why because straight is a straight there is no uh, nothing called design there we have to design the curves okay so part of your job is done why you don't have to uh, decide anything of the uh, straights okay just draw a line from one point to another that is being designed okay so our design concerns are only on curves okay so the types of curves used for horizontal geometry are as follows what are these type of curves simple circular curves compound curves reverse curves similar curves and then transient curves 
so we will discuss them in detail right so this is a simple curve you know there is one tangent here another tangent there and you connect these two tangents by a curve so that is called a simple curve and then there is a reverse curve reverse curve is here there is one curve clockwise direction there is another curve anti-clockwise direction and they are being connected in a common tangent point so that is called a reverse curve right and uh, compound curve means there is one curve to the clockwise direction there is another curve second curve to the clockwise direction but their radii are different so that is called a compound curve and you know this is a transition curve or a spiral here radius changes every point if you measure the radius they are different okay so that is uh, what you call uh, transition curve or a spiral curve right so we'll discuss general con consideration of a horizontal line so what are the general considerations of a horizontal line now alignment should be maintained as directional as feasible okay what do you mean by this alignment should be maintained as directional as feasible so what do you mean by this so let me show you right right just think right just think now you have say one point okay say this is one point say this is another point so what do they mean by uh, the alignment should be as directional as feasible so that means it is better if you can draw it like this okay so this is quite directional so what about going like this this is not really directional okay or what about going this going this way this is not really directional right or what about going this way this is of course not really directional so directional one is this black one okay directional one is this black one but still you can go like this depending on your topography say you are going this way right still this brown color one it is a directional road so that means the road should be like this either like this uh, black one or this light brown color one not like this one the brown color one or oh, what is this color yellow or this pink okay And the other one is the topography of the region should be considered when designing the alignment. Now I have selected uh, such a picture here. Now can you see now that uh, there is a canal or a river or something and uh, that uh, road has been designed considering the topography of the region. Okay. Now can you see that the road blends nicely with the environment. Okay. So what if you are uh, say what rather than having this curve what if you are going this way without considering the curve of this canal or the river then it is not going to blend with the environment okay the alignment should generally conform to the natural contours of the area the alignment should generally conform to the natural contours of the area so what do what does that mean again i'll show you right Just think, these are your contours. So, 
So if you are going to design a road, so confirming with natural contours means something like this. So maybe you can cross one, one contour, something like that. So or the optimum one may be like this. The yellow color one may be the optimum one. And then the brown color one, maybe it is somewhat okay because always you can't uh, go by the same contour. But what if you are going to design a road like this? So you are cutting many contours. That means, so here maybe you are going down, 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 and then going up, up, up. So is this a kind of a, you know, and now only you see, because I got a message, participants can now see or something. So what I was telling is, you see, now the, the black ones, just think they are contours. Now, maybe your ideal road, maybe this yellow color one. And this brown color one is also somewhat okay, because this ideal one you can't design, because you can't always follow a same contour. But if you are going to design a road like this blue color one, so here what happens is you are going down, down and down and then up, up and up. So that means your road is not going to be a good one. Okay. And it is generally the accepted practice to keep the number of curves to a minimum. Okay. Why? Because higher the number of curves, what happens? Huh? More difficulties the driver will face. Better, the best thing is to have uh, the number of curves to a minimum. Okay, because the curve means that you have to design it and the driver pays difficulties and you have to maintain a proper speed in a curve. Okay, and uh, you have to give the proper super elevation, right? And uh, you know there can be uh, accidents if you don't provide these things properly. Therefore, the best thing is to keep the number of curves to a minimum. Sudden turns should be avoided as much as possible. So what are these sudden turns? Sudden turn is just think that you are going this way and you go this way. This is a sudden turn. Okay, this is a sudden turn. Sometimes we call it a uh, hairpin bend. Okay, these turns should be avoided as much as possible. And then a curve at the end of a long tangent should be large enough to ensure safe driving, else a sharp curve could lead to hazardous situation. Now do you remember the drawing, the, the, the road I drew here with the hairpin pin? Well, so what it says is, uh, such kind of curve should be avoided. And a radius as large as possible with respect to a particular design speed should be adapted. So that means just think, uh, if you are going to have 70 kmph design speed, Maybe uh, the minimum curve that we are going to discuss is later, right? The minimum curve uh, that, can that can support 70 kmph may be, uh, say, 200 meters. Okay, so if it is 200 meters uh, with some higher, higher super elevation, so what it says is don't provide always 200 meters. Go for higher curves. Okay, just like 300, 500. 1000, 1200, 1500 go higher radius curves and only in the uh, critical locations you go for that minimum curve. Okay, minimum radii should be restricted only for the critical locations. In the places where the use of reverse curves become unreliable in hilly terrain, adequate long transitional curves should be provided for super elevation turn -off. So I'll show you what they are telling here.
Now what they say here is just think that you have a reverse curve. So here one curve and there another curve. So what they tell is instead of connecting these two together have a transition curve like this. Okay, this is not a straight, right? This is a transition curve. So just think that this is say, say this is 200 radius. Okay, say this is 500 radius. So this transition curve changes from radius 200 to 500. Okay, but please remember in Sri Lankan uh, uh, highway engine, in Sri Lankan highway engineering, we usually don't use these transition curves. Instead, what we do is sometimes, yeah, instead, what we do is, instead of this transition curve, we usually have a straight like this. So that is a straight. That's a straight. That is what we really do. Okay, uh, then uh, we'll discuss the types of curves. Uh, the number one is simple circular curves. A simple circular curve is now you know there is a tangent that is called the back tangent and there is another tangent that is called the forward tangent and uh, we connect these two tangents using a circular curve so that is called a simple circular curve like this okay and uh, you know uh, simple circular curves are just plain circular curves whose design will be governed by following factors okay so we are going to design a simple circular curve Minimum radius of curve for super elevation development requirement and the minimum length of the curve. What do you mean by this uh, super elevation development requirement? Right? Then that's a question. Well, again, I'll show. Now just think, right, this is a straight, another straight, and this is your curve. Oh. Now my drawings are not very pretty, right? No, we will draw it properly otherwise you will not really understand it. Say this is one curve. Ouch. This is one curve say. Now you guys are not coming to the university to see what the difficulty that I am having huh? to draw these things in paint or something, right? Okay, now uh, this is the straight and there is another straight and this is the curve, right? So what do you mean by super elevation? So I'll draw uh, the road cross section in several locations. Road cross section, right? If you cut the cross, if you cut the road, that is what you see. Say here, the, your road cross section. Uh, will be like this.
this is your broad cross section okay and now when you go somewhere here see somewhere here it will be like this okay and when you go here your road cross section will be like this and again when you go somewhere here your road cross section will be like this and finally your road cross section will come back to the original one like this do you understand what is this is a road cross section okay now ah uh, here this wrong huh? here your road cross section will be like this same thing huh? super elevated can you see now lhs side is first it is minus 2.5 and then it beca became zero and then it became plus 2.5 then again it became zero and uh, here so again it became normal minus 2.5 i'm not only speaking about lhs side right rhs side remains same now you know from here to here there should be a distance from here to here there should be a distance from here to here there should be a distance and from here to here there should be a distance okay so this is what you call super elevation development lens so super elevation has to develop gradually otherwise at the you know at uh, one location say at 100 meter chain edge you can't have this cross section and 101 location you can't have this cross section so maybe this is 100 100 meter chain edge this is 130 meter chain edge so there is something called uh, you know 30 meter super elevation development so they should be adequate understood and the minimum length of the curve so you can't have very small curves that is not very proper okay so you have to have uh, the uh, some uh, you know some uh, a curve length that is uh, uh, you know later we'll di discuss uh, now if our super elevation development it is le you have to have minimum 5 over 3 le 5 over 3 le right so we'll discuss them later right then uh, the minimum curve radius is designed with the following objectives in view the design speed of the curve should represent the speed below which most drivers operate say if you are going to design a curve if it is for uh, 70 kmph now most drivers should operate below that speed okay just think that in uh, uh, so how how is going to be governed with the side distance okay now if you have a side distance that means if in front of you you see the uh, road uh, very nicely so you are going to go for higher speeds right that is how you know uh, so even though you have designed it for 30 kmph if there is a very good side distance people will try to accelerated into higher speeds so if you are going to provide a very good uh, uh, side distance or depending on the topography if it is a, a very good side distance you have to have you have to have a higher radius the tendency of slow moving vehicles to track toward the center okay so if you are going to have a, a you know a, very narrow curve slow moving vehicles will come into the center and maybe they will try to slow moving vehicle what are the slow moving vehicles 
uh, like uh, you know the the trucks and the trailers and things okay so they will come to the center and sometimes they will encroach the other lane also and stability of high laden commercial vehicles okay if you are going to provide higher super elevation what will happen this vehicle will sometimes will topple okay sometimes will topple if you are having very high super elevations okay so length available to introduce the necessary super elevation okay that is what we discussed so again i'll show you just think that if you are going to have a very narrow curve just think uh, it's a say some very narrow curve like this okay your super elevation will be like this right and just think that i am going to draw a vehicle And what will happen? This can topple like this. Or this vehicle can come towards the center. Okay. And this is minimum radii for different super elevations. This is minimum radii for different super elevations. Now you can see uh, if your design speed is 70, how you are going to read this table? If your design speed is 70, right? If you are going to plan to provide a super elevation of 4, you have to have minimum 205 meter radius. Or else you can interpret it it like this if your design speed is 70 and uh, if uh, if the curve radius that you can provide is 205 your super elevation should be 4 if you are going to design for 50 kmph because at the beginning of the design you should know what is your design speed that you have to decide okay usually in sri lanka we have either 70 kmph in rural areas or 50 kmph in uh, urban areas okay so just think that you are going to design something in an urban area so it is 50 kmph and let's say uh, the the curve radius that you can provide is say 95 so you have to provide 4 percent super elevation and maybe just think that you have the the curve radius that you can provide is 110 and your design speed is 50 so what should be your uh, curve radius the super elevation it should be 2.5 Okay, so that means it is 110. Why? Because it is greater than 200, sorry, 2.5 percent super elevation. So you have to have a very proper understanding on this table because uh, we are going to uh, ask you a question on this. Maybe uh, because I am not preparing papers, but anyway, uh, that I have seen your uh, papers in the last years. So maybe they will ask you to say, uh, you know that equation R, is R equals V squared 127 plus E into E plus simple F. So uh, maybe they will give you the parameters and they will ask you to derive the correct radius. So that's one thing. Okay. And uh, maybe they will give you this table and they will ask you, so your uh, curve radius is say, say 200 meters okay say 200 meters uh, if it is 200 meters if you are going to provide if you are go going to design your uh, speed 70 kmph what will be your super elevation so it is 200 it is between this one and this one now, now don't interpolate and put something in between instead if it is 200 if it is lesser than 205 you have to go for 5 percent super elevation okay so that means it's like you have to round off it to the nearest uh, 
least count so not the, the least super elevation okay and adverse cross fall what do you mean by this adverse cross fall now please understand what is the centrifugal force centrifugal force is mv squared over r so higher the r what will happen higher the r what happens is uh, your uh, this uh, Okay, so uh, higher the R, what happens is the centrifugal force is going to be very less. Okay, so once uh, the centrifugal force is going to be very less, you don't want to super elevate your rod. Instead, you can have the normal cross force. So maybe uh, you are having some uh, questions on right. Okay, now this is the normal cross fall. This is normal cross fall, and this is the super elevated section. This is super elevated section. Say so this is the center line. This is normal cross fall. So what they tell is, you know, when it comes to say it is, sorry, you know, it is. M V squared over R. So when you go for higher radii, you don't want to super elevate like this. Instead, you can go for the same normal cross fall. So then you know, even though there is a, uh, you know, uh, even though there is centrifugal force, you don't want to have super elevated section. Therefore. You go for this normal cross fall and you call it adverse cross fall. Okay. And then we'll discuss a little bit about trans. Uh, about transition curve, uh, you know uh, there is one curve, there is another curve, and the radius changes from this to this. Okay. Right. Uh, so any motor vehicle follows a transition path as it enters or leaves a circular horizontal curve. Right. The steering change and the consequent gain or loss of centrifugal force cannot be affected instantly. So that I think that you can understand that. So the steering change or the consequent gain or loss of centrifugal force. Because now you know once you uh, change the steering, okay, once you steer, what happens? So you are centrifugal because you know just think you are traveling in a uh, straight line, okay. Now, is there any centrifugal force? No. Right? So, then you enter a curve. Now, there comes a centrifugal force. So, can you have a sudden such change? Okay. So, that sudden changes like these are okay for minus speeds. Okay. So, uh, these are perfectly okay for minus speeds up to 80 kmph. But after that, what happens? So you cannot insert a sudden centrifugal force so that uh, your vehicle will be dragged away. Okay, therefore, we are going to give a transition curve. So if, if you uh, go from a straight to curve and you have a transition curve in between, what happens is the radius changes from. So what is the radius of a straight? I think you know, you are final year engineering students. So this uh, radius of a state is infinity. So from maybe from infinity to 3500 radius because I'm speaking about expresses, right? So maybe you are going from infinity to 3500. Okay. So uh, then uh, we go for, so that is the use of a transition curve. 
Then for most curves, the average driver can effect a suitable transition path within the limits of normal lane width. That is for minus speeds. So you can't call 70 minus speeds. Of course, lower speeds, right? However, with combinations of high speed and sharp curvature, the resultant longer transition can result in crowding and sometimes actual occupation. and actual uh, occupation of adjoining lanes. Okay, so what happens if you are not going to provide this transition curve, uh, of course in expresses, the vehicles can encroach into other, to the opposite lane. Okay, in such instances, transition curves would be appropriate because they make it easier for a driver to confine the vehicle to his or her own lane. Okay. Now understand why we use transition curves. Now please understand in Sri Lanka of course we go we use transition curves only for expresses. But in some other countries sometimes people use uh, you know the designers use transition curves for uh, normal for normal roads as well that is for the betterment. Okay. The employment of transition curves between tangents and sharp circular curves and between circular curves or substantially different radii warrants consideration. Okay. So, if you are going to have a tangent and a sharp circular curve or a, a circular curves of substantial different radii. So, that means say uh, one radius is, say it is, uh, uh, we'll say uh, it is 100 meter and the next radius say it is 1000 meter. So, 900 degrees. So, maybe you can have a transition curve in between right but i'm stressing again please understand in sri lanka we use transition curves only for the expresses not for uh, you know uh, the normal roads or national roads okay and then this is a compound curve you can understand uh, there is one curve clockwise direction the other curve again clockwise direction but their radii are different. A compound curve is a series of two or more single curves that run in the same direction and join in a common tangent point. Okay and so uh, they join in a common tangent point. Right. This is also same. Right. So you can see compound curve here. Uh, I am not very sure whether this picture is correct. Now please assume this is one curve into this direction and then again to this direction. Seems like reverse, I don't know. Right? In the places where the topography of the portion of an existing control such as bridge or level crossing does not permit to use a single curve, simple curve with two radii may be adapted. As a general rule, compound curves are avoided wherever possible and the single curves are used instead. So, I'll show you. Now, what they are telling is like this. Okay. Just think, there is a bridge here. Ouch. Not okay, I'll draw properly. Just think that there is a bridge here. Okay, now just think now. You want to have a curve and what is your uh, the condition definitely it has to go in the center of this bridge so say uh, what happened this is your bridge right so say there is one straight here 
and another state here now you have to you have to have a curve to match so you understand it's not possible so what you do is you use two curves okay So it is really difficult to show right but anyway it is like this you know instead of one curve you are having two curves but they should be tangent here right they should be tangent here understand and uh, this should be in the center because we are designing the center line that i just wanted to show you Uh, so, in case the necessity of a compound curve is inevitable, the radius of the flatter curve should not be more than 50% greater than the radius of the sharper curve. That means, say if you are going to have a compound curve, if your first curve is say 100 meter, the second curve should be not greater than 150. But uh, you know in practical uh, situations, you can't go like that. Sometimes we go for say 100 meter and then maybe 200 meter or 300 meter but don't usually go for say very high differences like say one curve is 100 meter the other curve is 1000 meter so it's not very proper and uh, not very nice okay nevertheless the use of compound curves provides the designer with a flexible tool to better fit the highways to the terrain and other ground control now uh, the next one is reverse curves Okay, uh, reverse curve is two curves in different directions, like this. And a reverse curve is a curve of opposite direction with common or near common tangent points. Now you can see here one direction, yeah, this one is other direction. What is this? What is this diagram down? That is super elevation development, right? So just think about this is the LHS side of the road. So graphically they have shown this is super elevation there is super elevation so super elevation is coming down at the common tangent point it's going to be zero and then again it goes to the normal uh, cross four minus 2.5 right if you can see the rhs side so it is coming uh, from the normal and then because you know here you can see this curve is anti-clockwise so your rhs side should be elevated this is clockwise direction so your lhs side should be elevated so that is what they have done it is elevated and then is coming down and then comes back to the normal cross pole the rhs side here it is coming from the normal side and then it is elevated to plus value and after that curve it will again go back to the minus 2.5 so accounting for the difficulty in altering super elevation direction so this is the altering of super elevation direction reverse curves with common tangent point should be avoided as much as possible okay so these reverse curves should be avoided as much as possible but even though they say like this please remember in Sri Lankan rehabilitation projects we have a free hand in using reverse curves why because we can't change the alignment very much although we try to bring them into the design standards so we bring them into the design standards but you can't change a lot 
Yet the uh, reverse curves are unavoidable under following conditions. If the planned transitions are used, if the curve radius is greater than the radius for which transition is not required, where circular curves are used without transition, the true reverse. Now there are a lot of things like this, but forget about all these things. Why do we use reverse curves? Uh, these are just a theory from the textbooks. Why we use the reverse curves? Because mostly in uh, rehabilitation projects, okay, we can't go for very drastic changes. Uh, only thing is what we do is we bring that road into our design standards, keeping it is uh, uh, keeping its uh, nature as it is. Okay, so we ga can't go for drastic changes because you know if you are going to drastically change a road, what will happen? You will have to acquire lands and buildings of many inhabitants nearby. That's the reason. Okay. Other thing is if it is a new road, if the topography according to the topography. So maybe you have to have a reverse curve because if you don't use the reverse curve, what will happen is maybe you are going to, uh, you know, you will have to acquire an archaeological site or something like that. Okay. So, you know, uh, in, uh, I'll tell you a story. Uh, now, some 10 years back, we had to design uh, uh, some roundabouts and things in Andhra. You remember? Uh, there was a program called Dietacule or something, okay, in Anuradhapura. So, we had to, our design office had to design some roundabouts in Anuradhapura. So, uh, you know what we do? Uh, usually, what we do is, uh, we have our uh, design at the office in Colombo and after that only, uh, we go to the site. Now, uh, we did some uh, very proper roundabouts, uh, acquiring as much as possible, uh, giving the proper design standards and everything. And then we went to Anuradhapura. You know what have, what we have done? We had actually acquired Isurumunia also, okay, for our roundabout. So, these kind of things are not allowed. Okay, so can you, uh, I mean, can you acquire Isurumunia? Uh, to design a road or a roundabout, not possible. So in such locations, maybe we'll have to go for this kind of reverse curves or compound curves or whatever. Okay. And then the similar curve is, you know, there are two curves in a similar direction and here there is a very small tangent. There is a very small tangent. It should be noted that the similar curves linked by short tangents are undesirable. Remember, this uh, such a, such kind of a uh, road uh, is undesirable. Okay, such kind of road is undesirable. Instead, what we could do is, you could have a one curve instead of two curves connected by a small tangent. Can you see the vegetation here? In this vegetation line, it is a straight, a small straight. The maximum length of the to to short tangent is selected so as to not to have much visual or practical effect and the minimum length of long tangent is selected so as to give visual and practical separation of two curves. Right? Then we are going to discuss widening of carriage on curves. What do you mean by widening? Have you seen, uh, now when you go to uh, Bandarvela area, or Badulla area or Nuareli area, in some curves, okay, especially in these rehabilitation projects, in some curves, there is some curve widening there. So that means there is the there is your white line, edge line, but there is some more width that is being carpeted. That is called uh, widening of carriageway. Why it is necessary? Carriageways need to be widening on some curves because a vehicle passing through a curve occupies a greater width of the road compared to its motion on a straight. Understand that? Now you know. I will just draw, right? Uh, 
right uh, if we are going to have a say if this is our vehicle you know I have drawn only one lane right so here when you are going to take the curve maybe you will take the curve like this okay so maybe now in the straight this curve sorry this lane width is enough but when you are going to take this turn it will encroach the other lane so i'll draw the other lane also ah. it's not very nice huh? even i can't draw uh, very nice uh, drawings in hand also uh, so anyway uh, now you can see now this vehicle is just occupying the lane width and when it comes to the turn it is occupying more than the lane so carriages need to be widening on some curves because a vehicle passing through a curve occupies a greater width of the road compared to its motion on a straight curves are widened to avoid difficulty in steering the vehicle in the center of the lane the amount of widening required depends on radius of the curve vehicle length and width width of lane on straight and lateral clearance between two vehicles okay 